You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And, without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Interactome. Uh, I'm Sam. I am a process scientist in the biotech industry and things like that. I do science stuff, um, which is not actually particularly important for this episode because today I'm taking a a little bit of a jump back into like grad school type stuff. But before we talk about where this episode came from and what it's about, let's introduce our other hosts. Hey everyone, I'm Joe. Um, I'm a medical student doing research as well uh and i think we'll get into it a little later but some of what i'm doing now is definitely relevant for this episode definitely looking forward to talking about it more all right and hey everyone my name is maya i'm a phd student i'm currently doing research now and i'm super excited to learn more about the drumroll mighty mitochondria today um with all of our hosts the powerhouse of the cell. The powerhouse of the cell. Yeah. Uh, You've seen the memes. Well, you may have seen and the now... memes. And now... It depends. I think it really depends on when you went to school, it's honestly. It's true. Yeah. It's really true. But uh, This is the one thing that I remember from high school biology. There's no way that's mm-hmm. true considering you're getting a PhD in this. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in all honesty, uh, for at least in our generation, for a lot of people, if you ask them, what does the mitochondria do? Everyone just says the powerhouse. It's the powerhouse of the cell. Even if um, it's not exactly clear what that means exactly, everyone knows to say that, which I think is very amusing. And uh, we'll get into what that actually means um, a bit as well. First, we should probably back up. Uh, I think all of us here are really excited to talk about the mitochondria. We're kind of shocked that we hadn't done this yet. Um, But (laughs) we should probably back up and probably talk about what's in a cell anyway so uh if you aren't aware of it at this point you are made up out of cells trillions of them uh wait really yes joe really there's at least one (laughs) there's at least one cell yes i have one brain cell (laughs) yeah that's the one yeah that's the one we're talking about joe (laughs) you might need to find the other ones and stick them together for the rest of this episode but so cells are the little bitty pieces that make up you and every living thing around you um, with probably a few exceptions. There are things in living things that aren't actually made out of currently made out of cells, but cells in general are kind of blobs full of uh, water with a bunch of like concentrated stuff in them. And besides being just a blob of goo, our cells also have smaller blobs of goo in them that we call organelles these are little subparts of the cell that do all kinds of different things, whether it's uh, contain your DNA or uh, make more parts of the cell or secrete important things like insulin or uh, other hormones <laughs> or proteins Protein. or just junk, yeah. whatever. My, my brain jumped to cholesterol, but that would probably be more confusing than not. Uh, but that is a thing that your body <laughs> makes. Uh Surprise, surprise. It's not just from your food. But um, one of those things that is in all cells that have a nucleus, so all cells that have their DNA in a special blob, uh, is the mitochondria. And so it's in things like plants and fungi and Joe, hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) One should hope. One should hope. Uh, And we'll get into why we're pretty sure that they're in Joe. (laughs) Yeah, uh, yeah, t- yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to learning why. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, they do, uh, one thing that mitochondria do is that they make energy. Um, or they, they do something important with energy. Um, so when we eat food, that energy is not directly, con- that 
that chemical energy, so like sugar, is not directly converted into motion or heat. Uh, we do not have engines in us. We do not set things on fire, which would be the most efficient way to extract energy from food. We have to do this in a way that allows us to do things like think or move or move and think, like, for example, when I'm talking right now. Uh, and so the way that our bodies do this is they take that chemical energy, which can come from any number of things, uh, whether it's sugar or fat or protein, and it, they, so our cells convert like all these food molecules, things that we take in into ATP. And what ATP is, is it's a, uh, it's actually a piece of what we make DNA out of, even though that's not really super important. It's kind of a cool fun fact that ATP is the same A that's like what part of the DNA code. But in this case, it, instead of being in a great big double helix, it has three phosphate ions stuck on the end. And this is super useful because phosphates are all negatively charged. And just like shoving two ends of a magnet close together, that has a ton of energy in it. Um, and if you could imagine taking two magnets and taping them together in a way they don't want to go, if you break that out, you can get energy out of it very quickly. Um, it's not its not magnets, it's a little more complicated than that, but essentially there's two things that don't really want to be together stuck together, and your body can, then the molecules in your body can pop those apart and use that energy for all kinds of cool things like, you know, making your muscles work or making a neuron fire or all these really important things. And the place where that energy transfer from, you know, the granola bar I just ate into ATP is happening is in the mitochondria. Yeah, it's it's really the powerhouse of the cell when you put it like that. Yeah, so that that's why we say that. It does a lot of other cool things that we're going to get into. So some of those other things are actually pretty interesting. And kind of oh, building on this a little more, um, mitochond the way mitochondria make energy is really kind of interesting. It's like this really cool chain reaction of passing um, electrons uh across the the uh or across the like basically the 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 walls of the mitochondria like they these they you have like these little different proteins that will like pass the the electrons to each other kind of like hot potato and um yeah electron hot potato shocking pun intended <laughs> uh and <laughs> as they do this um it, it's really it, these act the the action of passing the electrons to each individual protein um, triggers each protein or not or not all of them but a good portion of them to suck protons hydrogen ions inside the mitochondria and so they're building up this kind of tension inside the mitochondria and it, it's it's basically like a battery and so they're kind of storing up this electrical energy. Which then um, later on um, can be used to uh, essentially like power a pump protein. That way, when you look at it under a, like a, or with a cryo electron microscope, which is a really really fancy way of seeing actual proteins, it it literally looks like this spinny little gear thingy that hydrogen ions shoot shoot through, and as the gear spins. It forces um, the 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 phosphate ions that Sam talked about earlier together, and so it creates this cool. Uh, it's like a this really cool, very almost mechanical way of making a battery that can then be used to power a pump or power a gear system that actually makes. This ATP, which is an, this energy currency that can be used throughout the cell. And so that's really like the big thing that mitochondria is well known for. And I think it's just really cool that it's yeah. like a battery. Um, yeah. And I think like just be, just in case you're a little confused about how this would work, listeners, it's like imagine if you and all of your friends were standing at the bottom of a dam, like a, like a short like there's like around here, like there's a lot of like kind of short dams, like beaver dams and stuff. And you're trying to pump it's so and every time like you just like I don't know like pass a bag of Skittles around and you just take a few of them you have enough energy to take a bucket of water dump it up at the pot, top of the dam and you have a turbine on the end that's making this that's making energy that you can use you know electricity mm -hmm. so in this case instead of having a bunch of people with buckets you have pro you have proteins that are pumping protons not water up to the top of the dam or in this case the side of a wall in the cell 
And then when that those protons come back, it turns a rotor. And it literally does turn a rotor. It's wild. It's truly exactly as Joe said it. It's a very mechanical process. Uh, definitely something worth Googling if you like watching cool videos of science. Um, that that, yeah. that uh, uh, protein in particular is called ATP synthase. If you want to see a cool video, it's like a really cool thing to watch. It's extremely satisfying to watch. Just like it, like it's like turning and turning. It's so satisfying. Highly yeah. recommend. But I ac- I actually think a video of that was one of the first things that got me excited about science. Yeah. So yeah, I saw it in my freshman biology class in high school, and I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> Love at first so, sight with ATP synthase. Yeah, honestly, oh yeah. <laughs> the electron oh, yeah. transport chain is also part of what got me into biochemistry. But it, it's funny though because it's really just the the yeah, it's like the biochemistry equivalent of a bucket. A series of buckets going up a dam and water coming down a hill and you think oh that's that sounds pretty boring but the fact that it looks kind of like that in a cell is, is kind of wild yeah uh, the other thing that mitochondria are good at is and i mean this is kind of important for energy production as well is they're involved very deeply involved in metabolism and when i say that what i mean is taking different chemicals in your body um especially like things that come from sugars uh, and kind of breaking them down and rearranging like how they're like how the atoms are in the actual structure of each molecule so that your cell can, that your cells can do different things. Um, so one good example is uh, with, they actually um, help produce some things that can be used to make fats or things like that, or they actually, or, or they can be used to actually break down fats as well, um, which is pretty cool. Um, that's one example. Uh, any, anyone else want to jump in there if I'm missing anything? I'm not super familiar with that specific aspect of research, but um, fat metabolism, um, specifically um, like a fatty, a- fatty acid uh, breakdown, things like that are in the mitochondria. Um, another thing which I think we have more experience with is um, apoptosis. Yeah, I mean, uh, or just just stuff like I don't mm-hmm. know, if Maya, if you know anything about fatty acid metabolism. No, okay, so no. cool. So just just, just <laughs> wait, let, let me let me just fact check this real quick. Yeah, let's just pause um, here to just say that like I don't think any of us actually know all that much about fatty acid metabolism, but I'm here and seeing it. I was like, oh, the mitochondria like works with little stuff. It takes things apart, puts them together. Like a lot of other parts of your cells are dealing with like much bigger things than sugars and fats and protons. And so it seems like the mitochondria's job is to deal with all the small stuff that are really important, but the rest of your cell doesn't work with too much. And I just kind of was like struck by that just now. I was like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so I was slightly incorrect, but also slightly correct. Um, the fatty acids... Um, or, or things that come from fatty acids are actually transported into mitochondria. Um, but they're, um, they're very, very quickly broken down into, um, a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which is the, uh, main fuel for, um, actually generating a lot of the fuel that will later be used to produce, um, and produce ATP. Okay. It's it's a it's a very convoluted process, uh, but for whatever reason, evolution has made it so. Um, and yeah, metabolism is super super complex. Mm-hmm. Um, you have all these different things can be used to make fifty thousand different other things, and the, all those fifty thousand different other things can like. It, 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 it yeah, it's just wild. You, you listeners, you can't see me making a face right now, but I'm a, a biochemist, and among a, you know, bio, that's about as granular as I get. And there's like some people who do molecular biology and cell biology, and they have these diagrams that look like somebody spilled a bowl of spaghetti and then wrote words at the end of each one of them, and that's what a metabolism diagram looks like. And yeah, I, I it's, it's a, a lot. lot, and I, I like to focus on like one part of that. And like, yeah. you give me a problem in there to solve, I'll do it. But I'm not going to look at that whole yeah. picture, except to put that on a slide and be like, and we're going to focus on this little tiny part. Ignore the rest of it, <laughs> please. Yeah. But quite literally, like many, many, many different types of molecules are always being converted into many other different kinds of molecules so that you can, your cell can like have the energy it needs and a bunch of other things. And 
a lot of that happens in the mitochondria. Yeah. Um, and... Apoptosis is another thing um, that mitochondria are very involved in. Um, and they actually, uh, one of the proteins that's actually involved in uh, sharing electrons uh, between some of the other proteins in the mitochondria called cytochrome C um, actually can be released from mitochondria. And when that happens, it triggers the cells to basically just kind of explode, sort of. Um, it's a very well-regulated, con controlled explosion. But if you look at cells as they're going through this process, apoptosis, um, they it literally looks like little like bits of this, like the cell is actually turning into tons of little balls of cell. And it just kind of like falls apart slowly. And it's a very regulated process that is, um, it, we think is so that you can kind of like replace older cells with newer cells or if, in some cases. Or if something goes horribly or, wrong, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, that too. There's kind of two reasons why you get rid of something, right? You need to get something else in there. Or I was thinking like the apoptosis is something you really want to trigger with like cancer cells. Uh, yeah. I don't know if any of y'all, any of the listeners like watching rocket launches, but if you're familiar with like, for example, like I think SpaceX tried to launch something huge recently and it went badly and they blew it up. So usually when a spaceship blows up, that's not working. Well, what spaceship doesn't have people on it, obviously, but mm -hmm. they have a guy called the range safety officer who flipped the big red button mash and the spaceship goes away, hopefully into a bunch of flaming spaceship confetti so that it doesn't end up turning something on the ground into a bunch of flaming spaceship confetti. And the same sort of thing happens with cells, where sometimes you need to smash the big red button so that you don't turn the whole person into no longer person or whatever <laughs> whatever that cell is in. Yeah. So apoptosis is really important for that. Another uh, throwback to episode three. <laughs> uh, it's all in the name. Uh, we we had a very fun conversation about whether the word was apoptosis or apoptosis, mm. and uh, if Sarah were here, I think uh, I, I think we would find that none of us have changed our opinions on that. Uh, <laughs> but we all agree. Which... <laughs> <laughs> no one's here to argue with us. <laughs> yeah, but um. Oh, Joe, I had a question about yeah. apoptosis. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding it correctly, you're saying yeah that um so mitochondria are essential for apoptosis to work properly mm -hmm. right but then if your mitochondria is like damaged or defective can the cell still apoptose go through apoptosis i'm i'm gonna have to research that one i honestly don't know um, I think it's a really good question, and I'm sure someone has the answer, but I definitely don't. So it really um, depends on how it's broken. So I actually, mm. I don't know why I know the answer to a cell biology question. It might have been my cell molecular biology class. It might have been something Margaret worked on at some point. But when you, you can have cell damage where you can't do apoptosis, and that's how we get things like cancer, right? So like, if mm -hmm. you have a damaged cell that doesn't have... So, you know, apoptosis is regulated by a whole another bowl of spaghetti with words on it in terms of like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, if you have enough of those things break you have a cell, a broken cell going around you know, like that spaceship careening towards a village or whatever and the big red button doesn't do anything so sometimes that can, that's sometimes a source of where cancer comes from, right? You're, you have damage in that Are you talking about physical damage though, Maya? Or... I'm just like wondering in general, like defective mitochondria that can't function well, maybe because of physical damage or a mutation. So that affects them. We can hop into something kind of one of the things that inspired me to want to be on this episode, which is what I was I was sort of in a lab in undergrad um, that I was working on where I was working on a project with a protein called Parkin. So Parkin is involved in Parkinson's disease. I'm not entirely sure how um, mutations of it sometimes do lead to Parkinson's disease, but I've bounced in in and off of that, in and out of and off and onto that field a few times. And uh, there are some strongly held academic opinions that I'm not going to uh, charge into here, but <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. I've, I've seen some people get pretty fired up about organizations that 
you, dear listener, probably think are completely uncontroversial. Um, and I am not <laughs> going to poke that bear here. But the thing about um, uh, Parkin is what's relevant to, in terms of mitochondria, is Parkin is what's called a ubiquitin ligase, which is a big word to say that it slaps a label on things in the cell and say, throw this away. So it takes it like just flat the giant sticker on that, and then something in the cell kind of meanders over. Oh, look, there's trash here. Better do something about that. Um, <laughs> and when you get Parkin mutations, you don't get that label slapped on there. And one thing it labels is a mitochondria. So you can build up defective mitochondria, but you do ha- have a system that is supposed to remove those. Mm, um, cool, cool. And so Parkin is part of that system. I think Joe may actually know more about this, but no. All right. Uh, yeah no yeah so (laughs) uh but yeah so essentially if you have a buildup of defective mitochondria it can be associated with things like parkinson's disease um and so we were actually pretty interested in understanding you know how parkin works so we could figure out how it breaks and then why we're not clearing defective mitochondria it could also be that you know uh, these ubiquitin ligases um if ubiquitin if you think about where that name might have came from it's because ubiquitin is ubiquitous it's everywhere um Mm-hmm. and ubiquitin ligases will slap these tags onto things not just to degrade them throw them away but to do other things but it's i believe parkin actually has other targets as well so but yeah defective mitochondria are bad and there are systems in the cell to get rid of bad mitochondria just like mitochondria can get rid of bad cells uh mm-hmm. everything it makes sense yeah everything in your body is supposed yeah. to be in a very careful balance yeah another another quick little fun thing um mitochondria they produce energy but they also can produce heat um through all their their energy production stuff and they that you actually have specific kinds of fat called brown fat which have which has a lot of mitochondria in it as compared to white fat which has less mitochondria and that brown fat is actually really um it's like one of its main roles is producing heat to help keep you warm um and bears have a lot of that when they hibernate, I believe, um, which is kind of cool. Um, but that, that's another one of the many crazy things that mitochondria can do. They're, 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 they do a lot of things. Um, but I think one of the, hey, one of the even more hey Joe, interesting before things... Before you do that, yeah. important question, because since you're, I think, the only one here yeah. who, who deals with the squishy parts of living things as a med student, sure. is brown fat actually brown? Sure. Uh, good question. I don't know. I, I I mean I'm to, assuming to be it is. determined. <laughs> okay, to cool. be determined. I'm a, I'm a, I'm assuming it is because like they had to name it somehow before they knew what um it actually did. Yeah, well, um, it, but it could it yeah. could have also been discovered by a Doctor Brown. Oh my God! You're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. What, what's in a I, name? I think, <laughs> this is like what I think we're gonna have. This is like what's in a name episode two. <laughs> oh no! I think we're gonna have to clarify this for our listeners. Maybe we'll have a little little tweet or something like that once we actually figure it out um but yeah um main point mitochondria can do a lot of really cool things but i think another thing that's really cool is more also just how they may have got there in the or in the first place which i think sam knows a good amount about yeah and anyone can jump in on this because it's something i think we all kind of learn like intro bio classes but the wild thing about mitochondria is uh they didn't show up in our cell cells. Our cells stole them. So, uh, yeah. So our cells, um, something like hundreds of millions of years ago, committed grand theft organelle by uh, <laughs> taking, yeah, taking in grand theft organelle. I love yeah. that. That's a good one. That's a good one. So our, our cells, uh, cells, especially the ones that are not multicellular organisms, are constantly glomming onto and sucking up other stuff around them. And at some point, the ancestral uh, uh, cells that made up all eukaryotes, all things with those nuclei and all the squishy little bits in them and everything, uh, engulfed a bacterium. And that bacterium, for some reason, didn't get broken down, and it just hung out, and it hung out, and it reproduced, and it hung out, and it hung out, and it's still hanging out in all of our cells, now with far fewer parts in terms of bacteria parts, it's not going to like live on its own. That's our mitochondria. It's a bacterial cell that just got like slurped up by some ancestral cell a long time ago. Slurped <laughs> up. Big slurp. And I think it worked out great. 
maybe can you explain why it worked out so great? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> like, why are we better now that we have the mitochondria in our cells? So, I wouldn't say that I'm like a total expert on this, but uh, you could anyone could jump in here. But essentially, bacteria can't make energy the same way we do. So the neat thing about mitochondria is it's actually, I think it even, has, it, it's got two membranes. It's got two bags around yeah. it. I think the second one yeah. might've been from when it got engulfed. If I'm, hmm. I'm not, That's I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. I've, I've heard that too. So like, let's, let's go with that. Um, and what that means is that whole pumping protons up a hill. There's like, it's, it's less pumping it up a hill, like into the environment. And it's more just pumping it into a bag. And so that means that all of those protons are stuck in the mitochondria still. It's just stuck between those two uh, membranes. Um, quick clarification. It's it's stuck. I believe the, the protons are stuck within the very inside of the, oh, yeah, yeah. the they, second they, bag. But yeah. they, they, well, they, they, they come from and they go to two places that are enclosed. It's all happening yeah. within the mitochondria. Yeah, if you're... I was I was wondering if I was getting that wrong as I was saying it, but I'm like, there's two bags. No worries. They both have protons in them. One has more than the other. The <laughs> bacteria, on the other hand, can't do that. One side is the environment. And so they're not able to leverage all of that energy the same way that our cells can. And they can still obviously make energy. Bacterial cells aren't rocks. They swim. They do things. They reproduce your cottage cheese or whatever i don't know whatever un <laughs> whatever unlucky things are happening in someone's fridge somewhere or out in nature or you know they're they're mm. doing things and you can refer to our food science episode where we talk about this in great detail. yeah that's why i'm like yeah there's something gross happening yeah that there's our previous episode was about this i'm not trying to make food sound gross but um <laughs> but they do that energy uh transfer really inefficiently Whereas our cells have this nice little environment where they can do all of that energy production in a nice enclosed space that's, again, enclosed by your cells. So everything in there is pretty controlled. Um, and so that is part of why we can leverage so much energy. We also have to have all kinds of systems to make that process happen. Um, I guess I can kind of say the cool thing that got me into biochemistry here, but I guess first I have to say you need oxygen. So the whole system with the electrons, those electrons, once all the energy is used up, it gets like just dumped onto oxygen and it makes water. And that's why you need to breathe is because you need something to get rid of those electrons when they're, they stop being useful. And so the place you pump the electrons to is the oxygen you're breathing in your lungs and your body's pumping around through your blood and everything else. Like that's why we have lungs is because we need to power the mitochondria partly other stuff there's mm -hmm. an exchange of gases happening there but um there's that is a really important part of this and the reason we can even breathe and leverage all that is because we have a special place to do all of that um on the other hand because you need oxygen for just a chemical process uh, you can break that so the thing that i learned in biology class way back freshman uh year of high school was that the thing that can one thing that can break that is cyanide so like hydrogen cyanide or whatever like the you know like you see like a spy movie and someone's mm. like, got like a poison pill or something what it does is it goes where the oxygen is supposed to be and it just hangs out there and those electrons are like guess i'll just wait and just like when the bus doesn't show up at a bus stop those electrons just start piling up nothing ever happens and when that happens in all the cells in your body it's like you're not breathing and that's why cyanide will kill you is not that it's like doing something complicated. It's just like sitting there. Eh, it's just like, you know, it's like someone were to park in a bus stop and the bus just keeps going around and those electrons just keep building up, building up, building up, building up. And so it's just like if you're not breathing, which is wild. I like learned all this big complicated system, the whole thing I was talking about, we were talking about with the rotor and everything. And it's like, and then the cyanide just kind of wanders in there. It's like, this is nice and cozy. Plop. And... That is why it's poisonous. It's not like some like profoundly complicated thing. It's just blocking the garbage collection from this whole system, which happens to be the oxygen you're breathing in. Um, and it's like a really strong like kind of bond or interaction that you mentioned, right? Because like, there isn't like a way to reverse the effects of cyanide, if I'm remembering correctly. I honestly or maybe there is. Don't remember that. I I don't either. I think we need a like an okay, actual we chemist. Can yeah <laughs> i mean i i just i don't know that particular interaction i i'm almost the kind of person who can answer that question but i don't know that system i don't have it in front of me 
and mm. um, it might be a factoid that I remembered. Yeah, no, that's that that in is a weird way. That <laughs> is probably true. I mean, if you if you remember it, it's probably true. I'll trust you on this, Maya. Um, I was thinking <laughs> about you. carbon monoxide poisoning uh, and things like that. Um, actually, I'm not. Maybe I will think about carbon monoxide poisoning. I think you might actually be able to treat cyanide poisoning with potassium nitrite. Oh, okay. This, okay, okay. this guys, you know the beginning of this episode where it says this is not medical advice. I mean, you're probably screwed if you have cyanide poisoning, but like, don't take this. We don't know what we're talking about here. Clearly, <laughs> I think the one one piece of advice we can give with certainty is do not take cyanide. Yeah, that's a good piece of advice. Don't poison yeah. yourself, guys. <laughs> and try to av- try to avoid carbon monoxide yes. as well. Mm. That is good. Yes, I have a carbon monoxide detector literally right up here, and mm. I'm pretty confident that I'm not in danger of carbon monoxide poisoning right now because this episode is recordable and it's not making a bunch of noise. Um, damaged... Wonderful. Oh, sorry. What did you say? Da- damaged mitochondria bad. Yes, damaged mitochondria yes. Bi- bad. Carbon monoxide poisoning prevents the oxygen from... It actually prevents it from bonding in your blood it does stuff upstream of that also mm. cool i taught a class to like high schoolers in like undergrad about poisons because it's like a cool way to learn biochemistry because it's like a lot of these like simple things it's just like so here's a nice little system that works great and here's the way you how you screw it up royally and that's how you, that's how poisons work like and so you could teach a whole bunch of really cool things really easily but um mm-hmm. yeah uh yeah I think one one really important point that I think we should mention is that um, when these bacteria got slurped up, um, <laughs> they actually they're not just like kind of like these these two bags um, or now uh, that are our mitochondria. Like these these mitochondria um, actually still retain some of that DNA that was in the bacteria. Um, when it was originally slurped. Um, and yeah, I think that's an important point. Yeah, because they were before, like you said, mitochondria are these little unicellular organisms just kind of doing their thing, then they get slurped. Um, but you know, since they're organisms, um, they have DNA that decodes proteins and tells them what to do. So what's interesting about the mitochondria DNA is that... Um, it's still kind of something that's actively used um, in our cells. So um, in our cells, we have our nuclear DNA. So those are that's the genetic material that we inherit from our parents. And that kind of makes a bunch of proteins and stuff that do all the work in the cell and give us kind of like our characteristics and functions of different like cell types and things like that. Um, But we're also um, still taking advantage of the products of the mitochondrial DNA that Joe mentioned. So some of the things that the mitochondrial DNA encodes for, so it includes instructions for specific proteins that work in the mitochondria. So it makes things like different polymerases and different factors that overall kind of help with the expression of different mitochondrial proteins um so if you guys want to jump in um if you know a little bit about more feel free yeah i've actually been um my when i mentioned that some of my research may be relevant for this episode uh i've I've been doing a lot of research on mitochondrial dna and uh some it actually like remember we're talking about all those buckets um earlier on like the the proteins that pass um pass like electrons onto each other like though so a large a large number of those are still encoded in mitochondrial dna like there are a few um if i remember correctly there are definitely some proteins that are needed inside the mitochondria that are actually the instructions for those are in the nucleus Mm. but um the mitochondria really like at this point like the the genome of the mitochondria is actually only about 16,000 base pairs long. It's tiny. Is, it's really, really tiny. Um, it's it, like for, for context, like, I mean, like you, you have millions and millions of base pairs in your nuclear genome, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yeah. But here it, it's like orders of magnitude smaller. So, um, so for context too, like, um, 
yeah, like, like for even more context, like, oh, you, like for how small that is, um, like when we do bacterial transformations, so like when you try to convince bacteria to produce a, a protein, the amount of DNA you have to cram into a bacterium to get it to produce like a single protein is like something like one or two thousand bases at bare minimum. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you could have single proteins that have a few hundred amino acids in them there's three bases that encode each one of those so you can have you know a thousand or so bases just for one protein so sixteen thousand yep. is tiny tiny yeah and the the really wild thing is the evolution has made this genome so compact that if you, it's it's literally the dna is in a circle so if you go around the circle one way you pre like or if you your the mitochondria reads in in one direction it will get instructions for one set of proteins if it goes in the other direction it will uh or if it reads sorry if it reads the other strand of the dna i think that's a better way to art articulate it um, if it reads the other strand of the dna um it gets instructions for different proteins um which is and also like different kinds of rnas and things like that which is just absolutely wild. And it's just all like some of the genes for one protein or another protein actually like overlie each other. Um, like they overlap and things like that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, like you might, you yeah. might be thinking like, especially those of you who like that with like analog music stuff is like flipping a tape or flipping over a record, hmm. but that would, it's not actually like that because they're mirror images of each other. It's actually like if you were to play the record backwards, you'd get an entirely different album off of it, which is insane. <laughs> it's really hard to even <laughs> picture how like this managed to evolve. <laughs> it's like playing. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like playing a, a rock album backwards and you get Bach. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's amazingly compact and so efficient and i feel like there's a lot of things that we can learn from studying the mitochondrial genome but to switch gears a little bit this still has to do with mitochondrial dna um but i will be talking a little bit about the inheritance of mitochondria so we've established that you know the mitochondria used to be these unicellular discrete organisms that got slurped by the cell and now they're part of us and we work together um, to function. Um, and I'll start off with a cool fact that um, the mitochondria that you have comes from your mom, so a maternal parent. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Um, and there's a couple of kind of speculations and theories for why this might be um because that's kind of like what scientists have observed across humans and most multi multicellular organisms is that their mitochondria and mitochondrial dna um comes from the maternal parent so again here are a couple of speculations and theories for what might be happening and you guys can let me know what you think um, one theory is that eggs um, have more mitochondrial DNA than sperm. So there's one paper citing that mitochondrial DNA um, in eggs, there's about 100,000 copies of it, while in sperm, there are 100 copies. So maybe it's an effect of having a lot of mitochondrial DNA hanging out in the egg, and then when um, a zygote or like um, embryo is formed, when egg and sperm um, come together and they fuse, um, and all of the contents of the eggs and the sperm fuse, um, there's just way more mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA in the egg compared to the sperm. So then when you um, kind of develop into a little baby and a person, um, the mitochondrial DNA that you have vastly outnumbers and dilutes out the mitochondrial DNA that's from sperm. Um, the second kind of speculation, and I think more work has been done on this, um, is that paternal mitochondria, um, so to clarify and backtrack a little, um, so eggs and sperm both have mitochondria in them and therefore mitochondrial DNA, um, but we only observe the maternal um, mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA mostly um, in the resulting organism after fertilization. So 
Um, there's been a, f- a few studies done on the mitochondria coming from the paternal parent um, having a self-destruct mechanism that activates when mm. sperm and egg fuse together and fertilize. And in addition to this, there's also a few studies um, that show that there's stuff that already exists in the egg that works to degrade the paternal mitochondria. Um, So this is kind of like the work of autophagosomes, so um, stuff that will kind of engulf the mitochondria. Um, Presumably it's like labeled with a degrade me tag. Um, And the um, autophagosome or kind of like engulfing machinery in the egg from the maternal parent um, will degrade the paternal mitochondria specifically. So I think there's still a lot of research being done on this, and it's really interesting to think about why it's been the maternal um, mitochondrial DNA that you inherit and how this is conserved across several multicellular organisms. Um, And I was doing a little reading, and there's a theory that the reason why that paternal mitochondria are degraded and the reason um, why they're targeted for this process and why we only see the maternal mitochondria is that um, it's the theory that sperms um, generate a lot of energy. So like, you know, like they're always like swimming and drilling and stuff, right? Um, and they need a lot of energy to do that. Um, yep. Those wiggly <laughs> boys. Sam is making a face right now. <laughs> But they, um, they do be swimming. Um, so one of the kind of uh, popular theories um, in the field is that maybe because the sperm is generating a lot of energy and it's doing a lot of like work, um, it's possibly overworking the mitochondria and then maybe causing damage in that way since it's expending a lot of energy. So it could be kind of cool that there's this like quality control for inheriting healthy mitochondria and then the ones that haven't been used as much are the ones um from the egg which are from the maternal parent um and i'll leave a cool factoid here um is that people um and this was in a great article that i was reading about kind of that explores like all of these ideas for why um we inherit maternal mitochondria exclusively is that um there's this neat idea of a mitochondrial Eve, so kind of like Adam and Eve in a way. But since each person um, inherits um, mitochondrial DNA from their mother, uh, in principle, there should be one like mother way, 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 way back, way back um, that was like the source of all of the mitochondrial DNA that we have. Um, but, you know, over time, you know, as things get passed down, there's like things change a little, there's mutations and things like that. So there's um, what I'm thinking, probably a big diversity of mitochondrial DNA that we each have today. To add to that, um, the you can actually track, uh, you can use the chain, the, the kind of the mutation patterns in mitochondrial DNA over time to track, um, like kind of building, kind of at like, Adding to what Maya said, you can use that to track um, different populations and how they've changed over time mm. um, and kind of how they've migrated and a bunch of this cool stuff, which I'm not an expert in. But seeing those little variations in the mitochondrial genome, um, it can be really useful for understanding a lot of different stuff about what has happened to humans throughout history. No, um, for sure. And like, do you guys know, this is just a thought that popped into my head, but does 23andMe provide information on mitochondrial DNA? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, or like got, other one, kind of like personal genome companies, but yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I've been looking around at the mitochondrial genome and playing around with it, and it's a really annoying region, or it, it, I think it can be pretty annoying to sequence um so just because like it's got a lot of a uh, very complicated like it, it can fold in on itself kind of weirdly yeah and, like structure like, it's got a, stuff <laughs> yeah it's got a lot of repeating sequences so i'm no expert but it may, it may be challenging to sequence it like like i mean we have sequenced it obviously but it, it may be challenging to sequence it effectively and accurately on a large scale mm. um i may be incorrect about that what though. can you even playing around with the mitochondrial like genome like are you like doing this in lab oh, or looking at it online I, or i i i basically um in my my quest to research my and understand mitochondrial dna 
I have the mitochondrial genome kind of in my online lab notebook. Oh, okay. Um, mm. on, on, um, since it's really short, it's, it's 16,000 <laughs> base pairs. I can just throw it in my lab notebook and I can just look at it. Yeah. I mean, like, and yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so that's what I mean. Um, mm. yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. There are like a bunch of really interesting papers out there about like kind of mitochondrial DNA variations, like you were mentioning. Um, so listeners, if you're interested, there's a wealth of great resources out online to learn even more about mitochondria. Um, but to start to tie up this episode, um, I wanted to talk about a really interesting um, mitochondrial based therapy um, uh, to kind of like tie in all of the things that we've been talking about um, so far. So um, before we were just discussing about mitochondrial DNA, um, and so we touched on this before, but when it's mutated, um, this could have implications for how well the mitochondria can function in your cell. So um, there are a few diseases that are classified as mitochondrial diseases. So these happen um, when your mitochondria um, accumulates mutation and it doesn't function as well as it should. And um, you can imagine that um, what this looks like is that um, metabolism doesn't work well, you don't generate enough energy or ATP like we were mentioning earlier, um, and also the variety of cellular processes that Joe described um, can also be negatively impacted um, if your mitochondrial DNA is mutated. Yeah, uh, one good example of this is a disease called mitochondrial encephalopathy lactic acidosis and stroke-like symptom or stroke-like episodes um or milas um it's it's a very uh, basically one single mutation like what changing one rung in the dna ladder can lead to the mitochondria struggling to accurately uh, make proteins according to the instructions that it's given um and that can lead to a bunch of different problems, um, but it can lead to like like the disease. Um, it says like things like strokes and like just really like issues with growth and cognitive function and neurodevelopment and things like that. It's really it it can be very uh, not a good time um, mm. to experience this kind of illness. Oh, um, so that's what. Yeah. That's one example of a specific disease. Uh, that that one's pretty rare, um, but it's a one like one of the prototypical examples of a mitochondrial disease where you just mess with one rung in the ladder and it throws off a lot of things. And I, I mean, there there are I'm sure there are other factors that can play a role in there, but that's um, that's something that definitely is of interest for research in the mitochondrial disease field. Oh yeah, 100%. So the therapy that I wanted to mention um, is a potential way to work around um, this mitochondrial disease. So there's something called mitochondrial replacement therapy or MRT for short. Um, and the idea of this therapy or rather the big goal of it is that if um, a mother has a mutation in their mitochondrial DNA that could result um, in a mitochondrial disease, this therapy will allow them to um, have offspring that doesn't inherit the mutation from their mitochondrial DNA. Um, so the way that that works is that um, you essentially just replace the faulty mitochondria with healthy ones. And specifically how that works is that um, you start off with a donor egg from a healthy donor. Um, and so since it's like a healthy donor, um, all of the mitochondria that are in that egg um, are healthy and they work well. The second step is that um, with this donor egg, you take out the nuclear DNA um, that's in the nucleus of this donor egg um, and you take it out. Um, and keep in mind, the healthy mitochondria are still just kind of like hanging out in this donor egg, still being healthy. Um, they're just kind of like ready to go. Um, and the reason why we're taking out the DNA from the donor egg is that the, um, and so that we can kind of 
put in the nuclear DNA um, from the mother um, that wants to have um, a child without this mitochondrial um, mutation. And so you put in the nuclear DNA um, from that mother into this donor egg cell. Um, and what you get in the end is basically an egg with the nuclear DNA from the, f the mother um, that, is, um, that wants to have the child. Um, but all of the healthy mitochondrial from the first donor um, are inside the cell as well. Um, so this should hypothetically result um, in an egg that has competent, healthy mitochondria and is ready to be fertilized. Um, and that's basically the next step. So you have your healthy egg um, with a healthy mitochondria and the nuclear DNA from the mother. Um, and you can fertilize it with sperm from the paternal parent. Um, and then once that happens, um, sperm meets egg, they fuse together, and all of the contents from the egg and the sperm um, fuse together. Um, and then this um, kind of fertilized embryo is then implanted and then carried to term, and then you have a baby born with healthy mitochondria, um, but has genetic material from um, another mother and father. And so um, the interesting thing about mitochondrial replacement therapy um, is that this is a unique case where the DNA um, of the child that's born as a result of this therapy comes from three parents. So there's the um, donor parent that has the um, healthy mitochondria, and inside those healthy mitochondria is the mitochondrial DNA. So that's um, parent number one. And then um, parents two and three are um, the mother and father that contributed the um, nuclear DNA that's inside the egg and then the nuclear DNA from the sperm that comes to fertilize the egg. Um, and I believe this is the only case that happens where you have three genetically distinct parents. Um, but an important thing to note is that the mitochondrial DNA doesn't kind of change like how you look or... Um, other like kind of like parts of the, or sorry, it, I, I'll just say, the important part is that mitochondrial DNA like doesn't really contribute to like traits that you can see, but it instead contributes to all of the functions of the mitochondria like we talked about before. Um, and another fact that I'll leave with everyone is that this therapy is currently approved and done in the UK and Australia, but not um, approved in the USA. Um, and there's a lot of kind of different um, medical and ethical arguments for and against um, this therapy that we can talk about another time, um, but I'll leave it to the listeners um, to peruse that on their own. Another thing that I think is really cool, which I, I think might be an interesting note to wrap this up on, is that uh, when you go to space, your mitochondria don't like that. Um, or they, they, they start to act a little different. Um, there, there was a paper published um, uh, based on results of looking at tissues in, uh, at like, I think, um, I'm trying to figure out if it's, yeah, it's, it looks like rats um, in the International Space Station. Uh -huh. And they saw that, um, and this may not be completely applicable to humans, but um, they did see that mitochondria get like all wonky when you're in zero gravity um whether that's because um like there's something very specific about gravity that plays a role there or whether you actually need to use like more energy like and actually have like be act physically acting against the force of gravity in order for your mitochondria to be like fully like up to like maybe it's kind of like a muscle where you need to like use it more in order to have it be at its full capacity um but regardless, uh, when you're in space, sometimes your mitochondria like change the 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 amount of these like buckets bucket proteins that we talked about earlier that they produce, and sometimes they change the the metabolites that they're producing and things like that. So it um and that that may be associated with different kinds of diseases, and that's something that is an active area of research um, if we ever want to go to space. Uh, in the long term, so that that's a very exciting and interesting thing. Uh, yeah, that's not so really, cool. Yeah, not really my area of research per <laughs> se, but I definitely uh, space like astro 
not exactly astrobiology, but like space biology, like biology of humans in space. I think xenobiology is a study of like potential alien biology, but astrobiology might just be. Maybe it is. Yeah, maybe astrobiology is the term, Mm. but I'm definitely interested in that kind of thing. Um, I just think it's really cool. Um, yeah. if, if uh, not um, a bit impractical as of now but who do knows think, maybe we'll learn something interesting do you think that the mitochondria are like all weird because there's not a lot of oxygen in space I don't know I mean it's like with we, if you're in the international space station in theory at least you should have the right amount of oxygen let's to hope <laughs> so breathe but yeah to so say horrifying fun fact mm. actually Used to be spaceships had more oxygen than Earth on them. They were in a pure oxygen oh. atmosphere or close to it. Um, and if you have more oxygen than on Earth, other bad things happen because things become flammable that aren't flammable on Earth, in Earth's atmosphere. And this ended oh. poorly. <laughs> yes, oh. it was a not pleasant moment in NASA's history. Um, ah. So, yeah, that was... <laughs> The, the let's just I'll put it this way. Sadly, the people who landed on the moon were not the first team of a- Apollo astronauts picked, or like they weren't the they were there was a I think or there was a whole they, we we lost a whole group of Apollo astronauts to a, of a whole oxygen atmosphere in a test. So Man. so actually, their idea about there being there may actually still be more oxygen in space depending on how they do the air max. Mm. So I'm not a ISS expert. I just know a lot about engineering disasters. <laughs> Yeah, for for context, we're 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 saying there there may be more oxygen yes. in spaceships. Yes, um, yes, space space itself, space itself yeah. does not have more oxygen. Nope. Space is empty. <laughs> space is well, mostly empty. Empty asterisk. <laughs> Another kind of advice that we can definitely give: don't try to go to space without uh, oxygen. Just just <laughs> if any of you are interested. Um, but yeah. I definitely I th- to wrap this. I thought up, we don't give medical advice on this podcast, Joe. That I, I think that's pretty obvious to everyone. Um, but uh, that's not really medical advice. I think that's more life advice, um, <laughs> quite literally. But to, to wrap this up, I think we can all say that mitochondria are absolutely out of this world. Ah, um, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the final frontier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess thank you yeah. so much for joining us for this episode about mighty mitochondria and we uh we hope you enjoyed definitely reach out to us if you have any questions feel free to um check us out at our website uh, www.theinteractomedia.org or is it theinteractome.org i can't remember it's anymore. interactomedia.org um, and there are three w's in the beginning like it's always been joe uh, well, <laughs> it's a www yeah, dot, i think <laughs> Uh, I just, forgot just one. Just Google oh, Or maybe I can't count. <laughs> yeah, just Google Interactive yeah. Media. You found us somehow. I don't know how you did it, if you didn't know where to find us, but <laughs> congrats. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're also on uh, Twitter, um, at The Interactome, and on Instagram, at Interactome underscore media. Oh, we're also, you know, make, you know, we also, wherever you found us, if you found us on a podcast app, we're also on YouTube. If you found us on YouTube, we're also on probably your favorite podcast app, if you've got one of those. So, absolutely. Thank you very much for listening. Bye. Cue music. Bye. Bye.